it's a very pleasure for me uh, to open uh, these sessions, uh, these three sessions devoted to the history of uh, Fiume. It's a very um, particular city. Its story is very um, fantastic, uh, I, I think. I studied the history of Fiume uh, since uh, I was 20. Um, that's very significant uh, for me, but for the history of uh, Europe. And I hope that you can understand this uh, with my with my lecture. Above all, from uh, for for what um, the history of 20th century uh, means. And Fiume is uh, a very little city was a very little city now it's different and now in uh, it, it is uh, Fiume is uh, in Croatia in Croatia and uh, its name is Rijeka from 1945. So uh, I will um, talk about um, particular years of this uh, um, particular city from 1918 to 1924 and um, this period is very significant and crucial for uh, all the European countries, uh, you know, this from uh, the, the school, uh, but for the school years, I, I mean. Um, but it, it seems that this, uh, these years and the story um, that these years contain, uh, seems like a, a movie script. So uh, please, uh, maybe it's only my impression, but at the end of my lecture, uh, tell me uh, truly if you consider this, um, this period for uh, our city, Fiume in this case, uh, just like a, a, a movie script where um, everything happened. So let's start from uh, the beginning. It's, um, okay, just, um, my PC is now uh, stop. Okay. Um, let's start from the beginning, just a few years before the end of the first um, world war. Fiume was a corpus separatum, uh, I mean, an autonomous city-state within the Habsburg Empire, not an independent state, uh, this is important to emphasize, but an autonomous entity. The city had a very developed part, um, thanks to Hungarian, uh, Hungary, and one of the most important trading hubs in the Mediterranean basin before the Greek War. So in the North Adriatic uh, Sea, we have two uh, big important city, uh, Trieste um, and Fiume. Trieste and Fiume uh, did belong to the Habsburg Empire, but uh, Trieste uh, did depend on Vienna, while Fiume depend on Budapest. Um, in addition, Fiume had important industrial uh, plants, such as the Whitehead Torpedo Mill, which was the first torpedo factory in the world, and then a major re refiner, as well as many other factories, as it was very important. In the 1918, so at the end of the First World War, the total population amounts to um, 46 uh, uh, thousand uh, of individuals and almost 29 thousands of Italians, while uh, 10 thousand of uh, Croats and then a few Slovenes and very few Serbs. This is the, um, the balance of the population. And other uh, were uh, German or uh, above all uh, Hungarian people. Uh, we cannot understand the events if we don't consider what Wilson said at the end of the First uh, World War. In particular, 
the, in, in his uh, 14th points. And the article number nine claim the following words. A readjustment of the frontiers of Italy should be effected along clearly recognizable lines of nationality. So the principle of nationality was the most important um, principle to uh, define in order to define the new borders. Because as you know, the great central empires uh, were over. And the article number 10 is devoted to this particular um, uh, situation. The people of Austria and Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and assured, should be accorded the freest opportunity of autonomous development. So, Fiume and Fumans see this article as something important and they um, link, they want to uh, decide the destiny of their cities following this article, the principle that this article number 10 claims. So let's follow day by day what happened uh, from the end of October. On 29th of October, the Croatian parliament proclaims uh, um, the uh, national state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, a new uh, kingdom that uh, had to include Dalmatia and Fiume. And far more, the kingdom recognized the sovereign powers of a particular Croatian Serbian Slovenian National Council based in Sushak. Sushak was a very little city near Fiume, and the representative was Konstantin Rošević. Meanwhile, the lawyer Ricard Lenas, that you can see in the picture here, takes office at the government palace in Fiume in the name of the National Council of Zagreb, which declares to assume administrative control of the state offices, but guarantees autonomy to the municipality. So the municipality guided by Italians, and on the other hand, the, um, the old administrative, Austro-Hungarian administrative office had to uh, um, uh, substitute by, uh, by uh, this particular co council, okay? On the evening of the same day, the enlarged municipal council met in the hall of a society, of cultural society, philharmonic society, and decided to take the name of the Ital Italian National Council of Fiume. I mean, Consiglio Nazionale Italiano di Fiume. Antonio Grossic became its president, and a steering committee chaired by Grossic was set up, which according to historian Danilo Massagrande, was the first, the very first independent Fiume government. Just a few words about uh, Antonio Grossic uh, that you can see in the picture here. He was born in Istria in 1849, uh, was the most distinguished representative of, of Italian uh, Fiume. Okay. He was a physician and surgeon, head of the civil hospital, and he became famous in Europe for discovering the sterilized properties of uh, yodding tincture that we use uh, still uh, today. So, the day, uh, uh, the day after, we, uh, we are on the 13th of October, the Italian National Council declares the city of Fiume, which was a separate body, constitute an Italian national municipality, also claims for itself the right of people's self-determination. So this is the um, uh, clear link to the article number 10 claimed by 
uh, the president, uh, the American president Wilson. The council invokes USA's protection and awaits the decisions of the peace congress. But as you know, the peace congress uh, is not um, good for, uh, um, for Italy um, because uh, uh, Wilson, Wilson himself wanted to uh, leave Fiume in particular and some um, uh, cities of Dalmatian, but in particular Fiume, uh, Wilson didn't want to leave uh, to, to Italian. So uh, this is a very problem for the annexation of Fiume to the kingdom of uh, Italy. Wilson would uh, annex, uh, uh, would like that Fiume um, will annex to the new kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. But meanwhile, in the city, uh, in that day, I mean, uh, 30th of October, an enthusiastic crowd parade to the city. Uh, uh, did invoke the annexation of Fiume to Italy. I mean, this is the, the strong, the strongest expression of the population. Mm? For this reason, for this mm, big parade, um, this particular parade was defined a, a, a plebiscite in favor of the annexation of Fiume to the victorious Savoyard Kingdom. Because, in, in fact, if you if you think. Uh, Italy, the Kingdom of Italy, um, won the war, did win the war, while Croatian and Slovenes in particular uh, were uh, fighting uh, fought, uh, within the Habsburg uh, Empire. Uh, we know that the Habsburg Empire lost the war, but in sadly, within the new constitution of the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. Now, also, Croats and Slovenes are the, uh, the winners. It is a, a strange paradox. I mean, but in politics, this paradox maybe can, can, can vanish. But this is the point for, for our concern. The day after, uh, we are in 31. Um, the ban of Krasha Mialovic appointed Richard Lenas as supreme count of the city and district of Fiume. So now, from this moment, a duality of powers is created. On the one hand, we have the Italian National Council and the representative of the Croatian government, on the other hand. So we have Antonio Grossinch on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have Richard Lenitz. But the situation changed sadly on 3rd of November, 1918, because four ships of the Italian Navy appear in the harbor of Fiume. The commander of the small fleet was Admiral Reiner. And when Admiral Reiner arrive, arrives, he's uh, welcomed by the Italian National Council, by the Mayor Antonio Vio, by Count Lenas. And Mayor Vio, that you can see in the picture beside um, Reiner, uh, offers the greeting of the city, explicitly declaring that Fiume intends to belong to Italy and that after being liberated by the Hungarians, it was illegally occupied by the Croats. It's a, a very heavy claim. Reiner promised to protect the order and interest of Italy and Italian citizens, citizenship. So it seems that uh, the situation is, <clears throat> is good for the Italians, but it's not so easy. In fact, a few days later, French and other British and USA ships arrived in the port of Fiume. So the Inter-Allied Occupation Corps is born. So you can see in this picture, uh, uh, here you can see the Italian troops, uh, Italian army that entered the city. 
here uh, the French uh, parade, and uh, on the left, uh, here uh, below, the uh, British army um, in, in the Corso of Fiume, the main street of the center of the, of the city. Meanwhile, in Italy, the famous slogan, Mutilated Victory, coined by Gabriele D'Annunzio, incited the Italian public opinion in favor of the annexation of Fiume to Italy. D'Annunzio is crucial in, in this phase, is very crucial. Introduce a new way of doing politics on, on doing uh, journalism also, cementing a sacralization of mass-oriented nationalism. This is the following, these are um, his words uh, that in, he claims, proclaimed, he wrote uh, at the beginning of 1999. So listen to his words. We fought for the greatest Italy. We have prepared the mystical space. If necessary, we will face the new conspiracy with a bomb in each end and the blade within the teeth. But what, what is conspiracy? Conspiracy, now in this, uh, with this word, the nuncio refers to the fact that Fiume cannot be immediately annexed to, the, to, 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 to Italy. So he thinks that is a, uh, there is an international conspiracy against uh, the um, against this project, and concludes. He concludes so: civilization is nothing but the splendor of the incense and struggle. So from this moment, uh, the annexation of Fiume to Italy becomes a struggle. A real struggle. In fact, 12 September 1999, the Nuncio managed to enter Fiume without shutting any bullets. So the interallied um, occupation um, finished. British, USA, French, and Croatian corps abandoned the city. How it happened? A few hundred deserters from the Italian army marched from Ronchi to Fiume. Ronchi is, is a little city, and uh, still today, that is near Monfalcone, in the region called Friuli Venezia Giulia. Is near Trieste. Nobody can stop them. The general Pittaluga orders the nuncio to stop at Cantrida. Cantrida is a, um, a, a small city uh, near, um, near Fiume, um, near uh, between Istria and Fiume. So general Pittaluga orders the nuncio to stop and go back, but the poet invites him to shoot him or step aside. And nobody dares to shoot the commander who enters Fiume claimed by a cheering crowd. So the population of Fiume was happy to see and to receive another kind, another sort of occupation led by D'Annunzio and his deserters named legionaries. But if, if we think to this important event, extraordinary event, uh, I mean, some historians um, recall uh, what happened to Garibaldi. Garibaldi, as you know, in the 1860, um, attempt to unify Italy, the, the North and the South, with Cavour, with uh, uh, King uh, Vittorio Emanuele II, but with uh, um, a military expedition. But two years later, 1862, the Italian army did shot 
uh, Garibaldi in Aspromonte, in Calabria. In Aspromonte is a particular region of Calabria, southern Italy. Uh, um, Italian army uh, they shot Garibaldi because he, he had organized another expedition uh, in order to attack the Papal State. But Italian army, uh, the, the king of Italy, um, cannot allow this, this fact. So even if Garibaldi was so important for, uh, the, for the history of Italy and for the Italians, because two years um, uh, in the 1860, it was the protagonist of this uh, extraordinary expedition to here army shoot Garibaldi. But uh, at the end of the First World War, a poet, like Gabriele D'Annunzio, that was very important also for ex um, excellent and uh, uh, brave uh, expedition that during the war um, he did. The general Pitaluga and non, not only Pitaluga, also the other, nobody dares to shoot the commander. So without, any uh, incident, Fium uh, D'Annunzio uh, managed uh, did manage to occupy the city. But also, if this very important um, goal, the uh, the real goal was another, as two other protagonists of this uh, particular event um, uh, confessed. I mean, um, if we think to Francesco Giunta, a legionary and one of the very first fascists, recalls that moment and he said that it was necessary to free the entire region of uh, Istria, Venezia, Giulia, from the communist Slavic nightmare, he claimed, and then march on Rome. This is the desire of uh, some people uh, who followed um, the Nuncio. And also Giovanni Giuriati, the, who will become the first chief of staff of the Nuncio, um, affirms that the primary object, objective, even if not declared by no one, was to demolish the Niti government which instead came, came out strengthened by the Fiume affair and above all by the election of November, 1999. Uh, their hope was to um, attack indirectly the Niti government. But uh, uh, two months later, November, uh, the election, um, the national election, um, <laughs> will uh, uh, strengthen uh, Niti, uh, Niti position. So for, uh, for this point of view, um, the, the, the enterprise, the Danunzio enterprise was a failure, but um, a dream, a strange occupation, uh, uh, this started uh, since uh, that moment from uh, 12th of September, 1999. And um, uh, for many, um, D'Annunzio appeared as the demure capable of forging the new Italy, the new Italy from the trenches, the new Italy that had come out of the trenches and was up to the sacrifices suffered during uh, the long years of the war. But anyway, little by little, the Italian National Council gave up its sovereignty to the Nuncio. It's very important because uh, the autonomous uh, Fiume was two years after uh, the, the war. Antonio Grossi is this old man here uh, near the Nuncio. 
And here you can see uh, Ricardo Gigante, that uh, um, he was the major, the new major Fiume. So even if we have Antonio Grossi to the National Council, even if we have uh, a municipality um, and with uh, its uh, major, Ricardo Gigante in this case, uh, D'Annunzio was uh, the, uh, the leader and decided, decided the sort of the, the city. And this particular, this is particular evident in uh, two occasions. One, the first is the rejection of the modus vivendi in December 1999, and uh, later the proclamation of the Italian Regency of Carnaro on September 1920. The modus vivendi was a compromise between Nitti and Fiume, in particular between Nitti and the president Antonio Grossic. Antonio Grossic uh, agreed in the first moment at the first moment uh, at the first moment Grossich uh, uh, wanted to agree to this compromise but the nuncio said no and convincing the uh, Italian National Council in particular uh, its president Grossich to um, to not follow what Nitti uh, want to do and with the refusal of the referendum, with Bondos Vivendi, and the uh, arrival of a new protagonist, Alceste de Ambris, as head of the cabinet, Fiume experiences a new authoritarian and spectacular power. And this new model of political authority is based on the dialogue between people and the leader. And the new custom envisions that in every crucial moment, the commander and the head of cabinet, the Ambris, meet the citizens in the square or in the theaters to illustrate the decisions of the command. A uh, direct uh, democracy, but it was not a democracy because they, they didn't want a real democracy. Between a, a, new, a strange model uh, between direct democracy and uh, uh, a regency, I mean. We keep the victory in hand, claimed D'Annunzio. And these are, these are two examples when the first meeting that the Ambris organized was in the 11th of January, in which uh, the revolutionary syndicalist affirms that the struggle for the Italian character Fiume also means a wider rebellion with the trust of the rich states. So this is an important element. This is a new element in the occupation of Fiume by D'Annunzio and uh, his followers. These revolutionary elements that emerge, uh, that emerge clearly. The second meeting at the end of uh, that month, D'Annunzio and his answer, his speech by threatening that there is no place for the dealers and the enemies, a rigor is necessary. This is a, 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 all these wars are heavy and uh, have consequence. One of these consequences is the arrest of the autonomist and expulsion of some Croatian citizens. Meanwhile, we are in the summer 1920. There are the incidents in Spalaton split in Dalmatia. During these incidents, two Italian sailors of the Na Nave Puglia, Puglia ship, were killed. Triggered much unrest and violence throughout Venezia Giulia 
This, this incident triggered much unrest and violence throughout Venezia Giulia, in particular in Trieste and uh, Pola, in Pula, where on, in Trieste, in particular on July the 13th, the fascists led by Francesco Giunta, that we have seen before, set fire to the Narodni Dom and in Pola the following day, uh, the same structure, the same institution. The story on Renzo and the Felician defines the incident in Trieste as the true baptisms of organized squadrons. This violence is uh, terrible in Venezia Giulia. And if we think that in Fiume, there were a lot of soldiers that were deserters. So, um, few men population fear that this particular situation can be very um, troubled. But the presence of these thousand legionaries really could turn into massacres to the detriment of the Croatian population, above all, and of political enemies. Instead, apart from some disorder and scenes in Croatian language that were torn off, D'Annunzio imposed calm and nothing comparable to the dramatic events of Trieste happened. In the picture here, you can see um, autonomist. This is Mario Blasic, one of the uh, uh, most important autonomist uh, after Riccardo Zanella, the leader Riccardo Zanella. And here is a um, uh, uh, curious uh, picture uh, that re represents a Croatian bank assault. But uh, really, um, the Nuncio managed to uh, keep calm in the city. And this is a, a very extraordinary fact, in my uh, opinion. So as you can uh, uh, see, the Fiume enterprise temporarily coincides with the birth of the fascist movement. The party will only be created in 1921. So fascists immediately attempt to exploit the enterprise for visibility purposes. In fact, the first electoral test in November 1999 was a terrible failure and fascists could now be considered over. So this is a, a crucial point uh, for me because it is very debated uh, still uh, nowadays. The relationship between fascism and humanism, uh, between uh, Mussolini and D'Annunzio at the time of enterprise. So, uh, in my opinion, I studied this, this um, problem and um, the only point that made the, a, a very alliance and convergence of interest uh, between uh, a few months, I mean, between legionaries and between the Danuncio followers and fascists was uh, caused by um, uh, the, the block of the city imposed uh, by Nitti and by Giolitti. In fact, they impose a freeze on goods for deserted soldiers and not for the population. But this was a pretext used by the legionaries and fascists in an anti-governmental function. In the early month of 1920, hundreds of children were taken to Italy and housed in private homes it was a fume, and to strengthen the media presence of the fascist movement in Italy. So the organization of the children's trains was the only moment of collaboration uh, between humanism and fascism. Another important um, crucial event was the proclamation of the Italian Regency of Carnaro. 
D'Annunzio indeed understood that the, uh, an immediate annexation of Fiume to Italy was impossible. So uh, he invented a revolutionary uh, state model that he called Regency. The Regency endowed himself with an innovative of a revolutionary constitution written by Alcester de Ambris and Gabriele D'Annunzio himself. The cultural reference of the constitutional charter come from Giuseppe Mazzini corporatism, Sorel's revolutionary syndicalism, so uh, loved by the Ambris, Soviet suggestions, elements of medieval Italian law, and the most modern and advanced elements mainly concern private property, the relationship between uh, the gender questions, so public education and administrative decentralization. These are very modern elements, in particular, the article, the, the fifth article claim, virtuous joy must renew from the death that the people finally freed from a uniform regime of subjection and lies. So you can, you have to imagine a chart, a constitutional chart that begins in, with, with these words. But above all, the, uh, the modern, uh, modern also for, for us um, question that uh, the Italian Regency of Carnaro, the constitutional chart proposed was the gender equality of rights and duties. Uh, this involved not only universal suffrage, but also auxiliary military service for women from 17 years of age, an enhancement of municipal autonomies that, that is a, a, a conquest also for, uh, a recent conquest also for Italy. But um, the revolutionary dreams uh, finish soon because of the, this in important international treaty, the Treaty of Rapallo. In fact, the Rapallo Agreement between Italy and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and, Slovene and Slovenes established that no state will absorb Fiume, which be instead an independent city state. And this on the right, you can see um, the ancient autonomous border, corpus separatum within the Habsburg Empire, and the uh, new border from um, Treaty of Rapallo that was this. So Fiume change and D'Annunzio um, rejected the, the treaty. But it was an important international um, uh, treaty. So uh, the uh, King of Italy and uh, Italian uh, army guarantee that the treaty has to be uh, realized. At the moment, Sadly, the nuncio remained alone. The fascists abound him. Many soldiers leave Fiume. Also, the two generals, Ceccherini and Tamayo, leave Fiume, which no longer receives political and military support. The end of the occupation of the Nuncio occupation is called Christmas of Blood. Now let's see why. Because from 24th of December to uh, 28th, Fiume is under siege, a military siege. Italian army is in front of Fiume in the harbor. D'Annunzio at that moment writes three proclamations. 
He intends to promote a revolt against the Jolitic government. He said, today there is only one duty of all, to resist until the end. The result is a bitter sequence of fighting, destruction, 50 dead, and about 200 of wounded. A city exhausted in a cold winter with few supplies, even powder milk is scarce, and infections outbreaks are spreading. So you can, you, you have to imagine this tremendous situation for the population. Just a few considerations. Human enterprise was an act of civil war. This is what some historians claim and personally agree with them. In fact, you can see on the one hand, human enterprise was an act of rebellion, military rebellion, rebellion carried out by, by soldiers loyal to the institution and the code of arms. They were survivors, survivors of the trenches. But on the other hand, human enterprise had also another soul, a revolutionary aspect of this enterprise. We saw that the two souls conflate for the first time with the rejections of the modus vivendi. But now, in Christmas time at the end of the 1920, the conflict has turned bloody. And this is the end of the Nuncio adventure, bloody adventures. At the beginning, the, the, the January was very cold. Here we are in the Kosala Cemetery. Kosala is a city um, over Fiume. And uh, still nowadays, um, there is this cemetery that is very beautiful. He wrote um, a leaflet entitled Il Commiato Fra le Tombe, The Farewell Among the Graves. He wrote, the Nuncio wrote, The will to ascend touches the last hate, and something of us exhumed, and something great was born beyond the present. Every tear was Italy, every drop of blood was Italy, every laurel leaf was Italy, and tomorrow, all of a sudden, the city will be empty on strength, like a crushing heart. It, it, it was a great boy, but it was a liar. In fact, the result of this tragic, marvelous, beautiful, revolutionary adventure or enterprise, maybe it's a, it's a, a, a technical name, um, that I prefer, opens the door again to uh, autonomous project, uh, project. In fact, the city of Isusitus linked to the Italian regency of Carnaro strengthened its autonomy soul, bring it to a level of open opposition to the project of annexation to the that uh, that the Nuncio and followers didn't realize. On the contrary, the hypothesis of complete state independence recognized in favor by the Treaty of Rapallo, we have seen that the article number four envisions the constitution of a free state of human. So this idea became popular among the entire population of human, decreeing the success of the autonomies led by Riccardo Zanella. So from a revolutionary dream, we pass to another kind of dream, the dream of independence. As they did for decades under Habsburg monarchy, the autonomists between 1918 
18 and 1921 struggled to preserve and bolster city autonomies in a, in a new independent state that was named Free State of Fiume. The project of the Free State was in, indeed justified above all with the prospect of economic well being. Zanella and his followers uh, believe that this independence uh, could be the, the, the right, the only solution, and would bring to the city uh, a relative uh, economic well being. But unfortunately, the life of the free state was very short, undermined by different uh, uh, factors. First of all, the stability of Italy, which was its guarantor. Instability of Italy because uh, there was a very tremendous civil uh, war uh, between fascists against uh, socialists and against communists. But also another factor was the weakness of the kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, which should and could have protected protect the, the, the free state better. And above all, the free state of Fiume was undermined by the undisturbed ferocity of the fascists. Some of them were former legionaries who attempted the life of President Zanella twice. Fascists gained more and more support while a hard civil struggle was raging inside the city. In the end, violence prevailed and the first real fascist coup d'etat fell not on Rome and the end of October, but on the Fiume government, which was cruelly overthrown on March the 3rd, 1922, six months before the march on Rome, before the fascist march on Rome. Um, under the military leadership of Nesto Cabruna, Cabruna, he was a former legionary, and under the political leadership of Francesco Giunta, a handful of men with violence uh, attacked the free state, attacked the, the, uh, the, um, the government palace, and uh, Zanella with other autonomists. Uh, and escaped. So these are the protagonists of this uh, uh, of this fact. On the right, you can see also uh, Riccardo, uh, Riccardo Gigante. Maybe you, the major, he was the major of uh, Fiume during the Danunzio occupation, and near him Francesco Giunta. See, the protagonist of the fire on Trieste in the summer uh, of 1920. Here is the protagonist of the, uh, uh, this um, coup d'etat. And on the left, we see uh, Zanella with uh, his followers, the autonomist of the free state of human exile, in Yugoslavia, in a little city. Porto Re near uh, Fiume. And we are, uh, this is the final last step um, the Treaty of Rome. Now we, uh, we are in 1924, and an international treaty between the Kingdom of Italy and the Kingdom of Serbs and Croats and Slovenes uh, decide to uh, annex Fiume to uh, Italy. It was um, a difficult an agreement, uh, but at the end, this is the new borders. So you can see from this map that Istria, uh, the island of um, Lucino in Kerso, here Fiume, then here Zara, Zadar, so this is Italy and this is 
Croatian, I mean uh, the kingdom of uh, Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. And this is Fiume. This is a bridge, an important bridge that you can see uh, still uh, uh, today. Um, this is the, the river Eneo, and this is Italy, and this is uh, the, <laughs> this was Italy, and this was Yugoslavia. Uh, Sushak, the famous city near uh, near Fiume. So thanks for uh, your attention. I mean, it's a, a very difficult, long, intricate, complicated history. Uh, I know, but I, I hope to, uh, to provide you uh, some important events, some interpretation about these events. It's not uh, easy to comprehend and to interpret. In fact, uh, they are debated uh, still uh, now. Fortunately for me and for you and for historians, because it's a very uh, extraordinary um, history. I mean, Fiume is a very uh, little, if you think, if you uh, think to Rome, to, to Berlin, to other um, city, border city. But it's very uh, particular for uh, its history in the 19th century, uh, century uh, the, 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 the first half of the 19th century. Uh, Fiume became uh, um, another city after the end of the Second World War. And this characteristic changed dramatically because uh, uh, most part of uh, its population abandoned. Um, and the most part of the population was uh, uh, composed by Italians, but not only Italians, as you can see. Uh, and the 18% abound in Fiume. So it was um, transformed radically uh, within the new uh, total uh, entity, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, governed by uh, Tito and the communist regime. So thanks for uh, your attention and I'm here if there is some clarification questions.